anything we could do would be enough from heaven's highest place you reach for us oh my sin and shame forever overcome yes the grave was overwhelmed by perfect love
child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen. child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sunday morning, the Lord reminded me of something I had told Mikey um, a couple weeks before when we were doing our translating God class and I had given him a word and it was beam and as I was giving it to him Sunday the Lord was really highlighting um, how special this man is is because 
He is one that will help carry the weight of uh, the brothers and sisters around us. But the Lord expanded on it even more today because I kept questioning and asking God to make sure and confirm what I told him was to be true. Because I told him that in Mark um, 15, there was a man that came along Jesus as Jesus was making his way to be hung on a cross. And there was a man that came alongside Jesus to carry the beam, to help him carry the beam of what he was going to be crucified on. And Jesus had to be crucified because he knew that he couldn't bypass the cross. But he carried that. So I looked up the word Simon. And the, the name Simon means to hear and to listen. So I had told Mikey, I said, Mikey, they mean two different things. And I started asking God this morning. I said, Lord, I said, will you show me why do they mean two different things? And immediately he said, Lorinda, he said, when you sit in your office, you hear sound all day long. But it's not until you can hear it all day long. But it's not until someone says, hey, do you hear that? That you start listening intently. He said, there's a difference between hearing you're a child of God and really listening that you're a child of God. If we say that we're no longer a slave to sin or no, no longer a slave to fear, are we going to just hear it and let it pass us by? Are we truly going to listen? We are a child of the Most High God. And I am so tired of walking in defeat and saying, Lord, I just keep waiting for the next thing to happen. But I want to see the next thing happen in Christ because I serve a God that's full of miracles. Miracle signs and wonders follow who? those who believe, not those that just hear it, but those that listen intently and know it and believe it and live it. So I ask you, beloved, don't just hear that you're a child of God. Listen to it. Really listen as they sing this song. You are a child of God. I'm unafraid. I'm unashamed.
Hebrews 10, 22 said, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I don't want to focus on the sinners and double-minded, but I want to focus on draw near. We were a church known for the presence of God. And the reason why when people walked in those doors, they felt the presence of God touch them was not because of our band, our worship team, not because of our preaching. It wasn't even because of the people that were in here is because the people in here knew how to draw near to God. And when we drew near to God, we brought God into this place and his presence was here. But through disappointment, through trials, through tribulations, through all the things that we have gone and also through sin in our lives, we have <clears throat> resisted drawing near because in drawing near, we feel like we're going to get spanked. We're going to get chewed on. We're going to get uh, smacked around. We're going to get told we were bad. But there's a king of kings and a lord of lords standing on the hill waiting for the prodigal that is in the muck and the mire. And he's saying, come, let me put my robe back on you. Let me put my ring back on you. Let me kiss your, kiss your forehead. Let me wash your feet and, and shod your feet. And let me put you back into place. And I hear the father saying tonight, come, draw near to me once again. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you that the presence of the Holy God will fill this place once again. The river will begin to flow again. And I hear him say, come, Lord Jesus, come. All right? Call out, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen? All right, come on. Oh, how he loves us. I kept, one sec, I'm sorry, I know. He just he doesn't pay attention, I'm walking up anyway. But the, I kept hearing the word submerge over and over and over again. And the word inundate. And I felt like there needed to be like a submerging in water for cleansing. And I was like, okay, what, what's it going to do with anything? But as soon as you took the microphone, I really believe the Lord wants to fill you to overflowing tonight. What, doesn't matter what you've been going through. If you have any slight of lack or any barrenness in your heart, the Lord wants to submerge you completely, put you in him and him and you tonight so that you will be able to walk in a new freedom just a, a rejoicing and that feeling on your heart that you know that you're one with him again aren't you glad he doesn't want to sprinkle us he wants us to be completely submerged so if you have anything in, in you right now that says i want a fresh touch from you lord i want to be filled to overflowing then right now Right now is the time to lift up your hands and lift up your heart as we cry out this song. Know that he is coming with power and with might and with love and with goodness and with mercy. Everything that we all need. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
loves us over that sin. He loves us over that disappointment. He loves us over what we didn't get. Because what we didn't get, he's got something better. And for that sin, he's got for forgiveness. For that misstep, he's got a correction. For that lack, he's got an abundance. Oh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Pastor, Pastor Annette has declared, moving in the office of prophet, we have exodus, that we have left the wilderness and that we have arrived in the promised land. And that in that promised land that, 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 that we're going to start uh, receiving those promises and start walking in to the, 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 the things that God gave us. But as we finished that song, I heard the Lord say that our routine and the way we do things in the old season are not going to be the same in the new season. Your method to get in his presence isn't going to work here. Your, your, your little head shake and your little tear and that song that moved you, it's going to be different. It, it, it's different in this, in this time. You're going to have to do and be and walk different. Amen? Reach over and grab your neighbor's hand. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we give you all honor and all glory. In this land, Father God, we receive. I hear a lot of voices, a lot, I hear a lot of naysayers just now. It feels the same, it looks the same, it tastes the same. I feel like maybe it's because we're in the same position and we need to go a little higher. Amen. We need to ask the Lord to remove the same lens that we've been looking at things for. That God's opening doors. I believe that December 1st is going to be the January 1st. It's going to be the beginning of the new year. And I believe that we have stepped into to the promised land, like Pastor Annette said, but I believe that the, 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 you're going to start reaping a harvest. Amen. You're going to start reaping a harvest of the new fruit, the new wine. Amen. Some things that you didn't plant, some things that you didn't build, some things are going to be given to you. And some old harvests are going to begin to come forth. Amen. Father, we love you, we praise you, we give you all honor and all glory. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen and amen. Shake hands, hug necks. Don't get mixed up. You may be seated. Thank you, guys. Ushers, if you could come forward, please. Uh, you can. That's fine. She'll be preaching downstairs. All right. All righty. We.
Let's, uh, dear Heavenly Father, just bless the offering. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Y'all guys, go ahead and pass that around. Come on, honey. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Oh, y'all did that so weak. Supposed to be shouting. I know. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to go backwards before you can go forwards. You know what I'm saying? I was laughing when uh, our apostle was giving a uh, little word, nugget, whatever, just then, because oh, for real? <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I was, I got tickled because of what the Lord had gave me for tonight. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. Go to First Chronicles, sorry, chapter 14. <clears throat> Now I have that old song, God is good all the time, in my in my head. Y'all like, what song is that? Want to hear it? Here it go. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Gosh, y'all need to lighten up. <laughs> like, I'm lighter now. Woohoo! <laughs> Are y'all ready? First Chronicles 14. We're going to look at chapter 14, and then we're going to peruse over to back to 13, but I want to do 14 first. Put this here so I don't drop it. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight. We just ask, Lord, that uh, by the spirit of revelation, we would have our eyes um, just open to hear and to see that which you have for our hearts today. Father, I thank you that you're equipping us, not just for awakening, but you are equipping us to uh, go forth into the harvest and pull it in for you. And so, Father, I just thank you that in this time of transition, uh, where we are uh, coming into the fullness of that which you've called us to to walk into, that we uh, purpose in our hearts to be attentive to your word, to your will, to your desire. Cultivate that heart in us, Lord, so that we can walk in great victory and great power and demonstration of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... If you haven't heard or weren't paying attention, the exodus is over. Hallelujah. That, I, I, let me tell you what. Uh, y'all be like, well, you know, it's good. Look, my, my time in exodus was freaking horrible. I mean, I, the wilderness sucked times a thousand, okay? But, you know, what's funny is that when, when you were given that word, honey, I, I thought, when they, you know that they, they were in the desert. This is, this is actually mind-boggling if you can get it. They were in the desert. And you know that when they're in the desert and they cross over the Jordan, do you know that when they walked into the promised land, they didn't go from like a desert to a beach oasis? They went from a desert to a desert. And on top of that, they, okay, they were in Egypt. Then they came out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness. They're in the wilderness. A generation dies off. They go over the Jordan River. They go into the promised land, another desert. And in that place, the Lord had to circumcise their heart to remove Egypt from them. But these guys that were being circumcised were never in Egypt. It was their parents. Do you, are you, do you see all the little things coming together? So you went from a desert to a desert. You came out of slavery, but you still had slavery even in your new desert. And though you didn't do it, but he had to take that away from us. Amen. That is, God is so cool how he does all that stuff. And I'm just now getting a, a, a revelation or a nugget or something, whatever that is. Um, so 
I was noticing how, um, you know, once they crossed over, that it was imperative that, first of all, that they, they knew they had to be strong and courageous. They knew they had to be, you know, brave. Bravery is important. Um, but they also had to have their hearts tuned in to the right frequency, right? We talked about, you know, hearing God being like that, uh, our AM, FM frequency. We've got to turn the dial in until we can hear him clearly, right? And one of the things that we have to do, because in the desert, you know, when we're first exiting, we have to, uh, it's easier, beloved, because there's a, there's a cloud by day and a fire by night. You know what I mean? Man is hitting your front door. I mean, there's not a whole lot of stuff that you and I got to do in there, except shut up. It took them 40 years to shut up. So it, that's basically what happened. For 40 years, they could not stop complaining. That's why their first battle is keep your mouth shut. Don't y'all say a word. Because it ain't about you. Jericho's coming down. It's not because you had something good to say. So they had to watch their language the whole time. So when we go into the next place, it's vitally important that we stay tuned in. Because there's not going to be a fire by night. There's not going to be a cloud by day. Man's not going to come to your front door. You're going to actually have to get up, read your Bible, which clutch the pearls there, Merle, because you don't even know if we can do that every day. Oh, that's hard enough. But we cannot, re- we cannot be uh, receptive of the Lord's instructions and his words and the, and the plans for war and the counsel for war and being directed, uh, uh, his steps and his light, you know, directing our steps. If, if we are playing Christianity and doing this only. So vic- victors, people who win, they have relationship. Amen. I'm talking to a Wednesday night crowd. Y'all are like, we all have relationship up in here. Because we're the Wednesday night folk. <laughs> and that's usually true. Now, if we start a Sunday night service and you came to that one too, then you'd be a real Christian. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay. That's how we used to roll. Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know. All the time. Prayer, Wednesday night. But one of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing is we're shaking ourselves from the routine. We, we have to purposefully dial in. The difference between the church and the world in the season that we're in is two things. One, our love. Our love increases for our brother. Because the world's going to know that Jesus is Lord by how we treat one another. And the church treats, I'm saying a saying. The church (laughs) treats brothers and sisters pretty crappy sometimes. We don't have a great reputation out there in the world, guys. Now, I don't want to be liked by the world, but I definitely want to put out a bride that the world has to go, even though we don't like her, we can't, we cannot accuse them of not loving one another. They're dying for what they believe. They love each other. They have fellowship. They have everything in common. That kind of um, fruit in our lives is what the world needs to see. Amen? And the second thing is that we don't just walk with words, but we walk with power. That we have a demonstration of the Spirit of God inside of us. And the only way for that to happen, either one, either love increasing or demonstrating the power and the beauty of Jesus, the only way those two things happen is if you and I spend time with Jesus. <laughs> you know, how, I don't know how long I've been preaching. Uh, I've been doing this 20-something years, and my message has not changed. It's always the same. Be in love with Jesus. Get intimate with him. Know his word. Spend time with him. Know his word. Amen? That was not my, my message. Okay, we'll go to where I was thinking. The Lord had brought me this the other day, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know, but I just felt like, yeah, he said something right. So we're going to do, um, let's start. We don't want to read all the names, blah, 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 people, people, people. Okay, um, David is now, he's already been anointed king of Israel, okay? So now everybody is all in agreement. Judah and Israel, like, you are the king, you're the man, he's anointed. And so in this, in this place, um, David is beginning uh, begin the works of building him a house, okay? And he had all this stuff coming in and, you know, nothing like building a house. That's a lot of work. Okay, so in chapter, I'm not, chapter, God, blah, blah, blah. what's wrong with me? Chapter 14, verse 8. 
and the Amplified Bible says, And when the Philistines heard that David was anointed king over all of Israel, they all went out, they all went up to seek David. And he heard of it and went out before them. Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the valley of Rephraim. And David asked God, Shall I go up against the Philistines? And will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said, Go up, and I will deliver you, or deliver them into your hand. So I want you to see something. First of all, David is just now, he's, you know, he's known he's going to be king. Now he's fully in, in his calling, in his purpose on the earth. You know, he's been doing all this, but now it's everything he was waiting for since that day Samuel showed up at his house. Okay? There's nothing like, you know, you starting to walk in your calling in a greater way. I mean, he, he had started it by doing, he was king over Judah. They, I mean, they anointed him over Judah, but he's, now he's walking into this greater fulfillment. And this is important because, I, like I've said before, this exodus that we've just now come out of and going to the promised land, I know I've said it over and over again, maybe not to you, but to people who I'm talking to about it, is that there's a Kairos moment in all of our lives, individually, but also corporately. And I truly believe that we are in that Kairos moment here, that we are having our beautiful gate moment right now, that because we've come out, now is the time we're going to lift ourselves up. Or, or we're not going to have wobbly knees and shaky legs. We're going to be able to, to dance and to rejoice and see that the Lord is for us and that we're going to begin to, to really hone in on that pinpoint of us being the tip of the spear and where we're supposed to hit in our city. Y'all just have to say amen because you have to trust me that I'm prophetically telling you the truth, okay? <laughs> I am forth telling. So I can correlate this right now in my in my mind and with my spirit because we've all you know, we've had all these things going on, all these different ministries that we've had going on, but I see them all now coming together. In the midst of all these battles this last year, in the pruning, in the stripping away. And in the barrenness, we have grown our roots so deep. And when you look on the outside, you may think, well, they're worse off than they were when they started. But we're not. We're actually flourishing in a greater way because our roots had to go so deep into the ground, into the water of the word, so that we would not lose our identity. And part of this, um, I'm, I, this is not anything I plan. I swear this, this is the spirit of God. Um, all of this has like stripped away some of the identity that we tried to take on as a body, but really wasn't ours. You know what I mean? I we and we all have to go through these things individually in our lives. You know, you may be called to be an evangelist, and you know, you may think you have to, but you know, you you test the water, you figure out what you're doing. There's nothing wrong with that. But. I do believe that all the stripping away and all the stuff that's gone on, that in it, we're now really seeing in the spirit, because it hasn't all manifested here on earth yet, but that's no big deal to me, because if I see it in the spirit, that's all I need. I don't need, I don't need to have this realm do what it needs to do to make me believe, because if I did, there would be faith. So I can see that in the stripping, there's been a greater identity. I know for me personally, the Lord has given me revelation about my own heart and some things that I've had going on in my life that were affecting my identity in Christ. And the same thing has happened to us corporately. But now is the time. When our roots get deep enough to get enough nourishment, then God can then, because it's what you do in spirit, then he will then broadcast. And there's going to be a, a working outwardly now that we've not seen in a long time. So David is now in this, you know, culmination of now he's the king. And he's just trying to build the house. We know that he has two things on his heart. He wants a place for him to live, of course, but he also has in his heart to build a place for the Ark of the Covenant. His heart was right. And now his first thing he's coming against is the flesh, that's what Philistine means, and they're, they come into the valley and David has already been very victorious in the past. And the first thing he does, though, is not assume that this is the same thing he's always gone through. He's fought the Philistines before, guys. He took down a giant. 
He's fought them more than one time. So he's still in the same area with the same enemy. But he did take matters into his own hand. He went before the Lord and he said, do I go up against them? And if I do, will I win? To me, that speaks volumes. He was king. He really didn't have to ask God, technically. He could have just gone out and fought them. Do you know that he could have fought them and probably won? It would be no credit to the Lord. So he, had, he was able to do whatever he wanted to do, but he stopped and he said, God, do I go up? And if I go, will I win? I thought, why would he ask, will I win? Isn't if God tells us to go up, don't we automatically win? Didn't get to answer that question. He's like, because God may make you go up and you're going you gonna to lose. You know what I mean? That could, that's, apparently, that was a possibility in David's mind. So the Lord answers, like, yes, yes, I want you to go up. I want you to fight them, and you're going to have victory. And David's like, whoop, whoop. And so he goes, and he fights them, and he has victory. And everything's wonderful. Now, look. So then he says this. It's 11. Uh, they came up to Baal, uh, Perizim, and David smote the Philistines there. Then David said, God has broken my enemies by my hand like the bursting forth of waters. Therefore, they are called, they called that name, that place, Valparaisim, the Lord's breaking forth. And then, look at verse 12. He said, the Philistines left their gods there. Oh, look. <laughs> all the little idols and all that stuff left. They were just all there in the valley. They went running and scared for their lives. So David picked them all up and he burned them all. Yay, David. And look at verse 13. Because can I tell you something without a shadow of a doubt, I know to be true 100%, is that your flesh does not give up. They just got whooped, dropped all their gods in the valley they got whooped in, probably smelt their idols being burnt. And they are so dumb, they come back. Now, I don't know about you, but I would think if I just kicked your butt and I took all your stuff, and I turned around, and you're an idiot. You're coming back down to me. I'm just going to be like, for real? And I'd probably just pick up my gun, not my sword. i pick up my gun and probably start shooting you. Because, hello, why are you so dumb to come back after me? But he didn't do that, which was so surprising to me. Look, they come back, and look what he says in verse 14. And David inquired again of God. And God said to him, do not go up after them. I wonder what it's like to have to turn around after you've just, like, beaten somebody and then you see them coming back and God doesn't let you fight them. He makes you turn around and go the other way. For me, in my pride, I'd be like, why? I can take them. Why should I leave? Hello. I, I like winning. That's my whole thing. I would see that as not fun and probably losing. But I, personally, I would like to make sure that I'm, I see myself winning. But David did not take it on his own, that he was supposed to go once again, this flesh thing, God told him, no, don't go, go over this way, go by the mulberry trees, and when you see the wind blow over just the mulberry tree, then you know it's time. Uh, that's like one of those, if you go down into Jerusalem, you're going to see a donkey tied up, and then you go get the owner of that donkey, and he's going to have a place prepared for you so that you can do the Passover stuff, but you're like, for real? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know what that's like for Peter then to be walking down like the road and be like, he seriously sent us to go get a donkey. Like, what? Y'all need to read your Bible. It's good. Good stories in it. <laughs> so what's my point? My point is, David had learned a lesson, right? He was like, do I go? God said go, and he went. Here's the same fight, the same enemy, the same freaking valley. I don't know about you. But probably the last year, I have faced the same enemy in the same valley 500,000 times. And I'm like, this is getting old. This is dumb. And, of course, I'm like, give up flesh. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I wish. My flesh is always in front of my face. Ugh. What I want God to do is use me to kill whatever is coming against me so dead that I could never have life again and come back to me. That's what I want. But you're in this flesh vessel, and it's not going anywhere. And it's going to keep showing up in every valley you see. You're going to see your flesh. But you have to defeat the flesh the way God said. 
to defeat the flesh. And sometimes you got to wait under a tree until a breeze comes just on that tree before you go do anything. And one of the biggest mistakes we all make, we all, I include all y'all in this, is that we don't wait and ask God, what do I do this time? We assume because it's the same enemy in the same valley, I'm going to have the same victory in the same way. That is good. That's, uh, y'all may not think it's good, but I'm telling you, it's good. It tastes good, you eat it. Because this is how we get whooped. Because we assume, because things are familiar. And we don't take the time because I'm Jesus' first cousin now. I know him. He tells me everything. They anointed me the prophet. So I, you know what I mean? Why do I go inquire? Well, that's what we do, isn't it? If we come up to the same bill not getting paid, we will follow suit with the same stress that we had before. And we may have, God may have told us one time in our past to give $20. And in that $20, there's going to be a reward, and you're going to have that one bill paid. And maybe he did that. But then, two months later, another bill comes up, and you go put $20 into someplace God did not tell you to put $20, expecting God to give you a harvest, and then you get mad at God because he didn't do what you said he should do. Hello, do you hear what I said? He didn't do what you said he should do. Man, oh, man. It's true. We think we run the show. I'm sorry. I think I won't, I won't hurt you guys. I think I run the show. And I have gotten my tail whooped more than once in the last 18 months because I fought the same enemy in the same valley in the same way. And I was not called to. And I've caused myself a lot more harm than I have good because I was familiar and not taking the time to seek God. And it doesn't matter how, how deep your roots get, guys. It doesn't matter. You can very easily be plucked up by not learning your lesson and this time seeking God. What do I do now? How do I fight this enemy? Because the reason why we have all these circumstances and crises sometimes in our life is for that very reason. Because we have been made for relationship. We've been made for intimacy. We're made for conversation with God. And we are so in love with us that it takes a crisis before we finally hit our knees to have that conversation. And I know the Father's heart. He's like, I really want to hang out with you. Why do I constantly have to put you in a place of striving and in pressure before you'll come to my face? And we become crisis Christians. And our, our fruit to the world is God is constantly punishing me. And we have no power. And we have no love. Because let me tell you what, if you constantly think, because you're going to be, you know, the, I can honestly tell you that there are times like even in leadership I can stand back and I can see crisis after crisis after crisis after crisis on your life. And I'm just like, get it, get it. Get in there and get in his face. Get it. And first crisis, you're okay. Still got your hands up in worship. Second crisis, you're still okay. Hands a little bit up in worship. Third crisis, I don't like that song, but I'm still going to church. You know what I mean? Fourth crisis, I ain't doing Sunday school no more. With every crisis comes a huge disappointment. And we blame God for all of those disappointments. And then our witness is so gross and grotesque to the world. They don't see a loving God. They see you saying, he sucks as a dad. All he does is give me a hard time. I said sucks in church. I did. Amen. So we would be wise to hear what he's saying now. Because he's, I'm telling you, I know he said the exodus is over. You've entered into the promised land, and we can be all, whoop, 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 we're in the land, whoop, 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 and then going to get our tails whooped because we are not tuning in and asking him, how do I handle this situation? How do I handle this situation? Lord, we have this coming up against us today. What do we do with this thing? I'm going to show you a place in the Word of God that I think uh, probably got David to this place. Let's go to chapter 13. So 
says in verse 1, David consulted the captains of thousands and hundreds, even with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and it is of the Lord, our God, let us send abroad everywhere to our brethren who are left in the land of Israel and with and with them to the priests and Levites in their cities that have suburbs and pasture lands that they may gather together with us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us for we did not seek it during the days of Saul. And all the assembly agreed to do so. For the thing that seemed right in the eyes of all the people. Okay, so. First of all, we see some humility in David here, but he's like, look, we haven't had the Ark of the Covenant here, and it's not Saul's fault. He could have said that. He didn't. He said, we did not seek God's presence during Saul's reign. What, he, what the truth is, Saul was horrific, and because he was so bad, he didn't seek God. So that's what, But that's not what he said. He said, we. It's the same thing like with Nehemiah, when he's seeing the, the, the condition of the wall, and he, repent, he repents as he was one of the ones who brought them into captivity. Y'all can't miss that part, though, guys. It's very important that w- we don't compartmentalize in our hearts, well, you know, that one, that wasn't my fault at all. That was all you, and so I don't need to take responsibility for that. Yes, you do. Because if you really were a true friend and you really were hearing God, you would have said to your friend, this is what I hear God saying, and I want to pray with you until you hear the same thing or we're both wrong somebody else come and con- confirm it. But we don't. We cut people off because we don't want to deal with it. Or we don't want to admit that we're wrong. But David, he gathers all. Now, what David has in his heart is a wonderful thing. He wants the ark of the presence of God with him. And no matter how wonderful our leadership is, no matter, we may have umpteen thousand wonderful things about us. But there are times when we begin to be moved by the crowd of people. We just do. Now, David knew, he's like, it's not a bad idea, right, to have the the ark of God come to us. Why would anybody think that was a bad idea? And why would God ever say no to that? Like, if we came in here, we were like, we should just call the name of the Lord. Be like, yeah, that's why we're here, duh. We're here to have worship and call on Jesus together. And we wouldn't have to ask God's permission. Can we do that? Can we all come together on Wednesday night, pray together, seek your face? Is that going to be okay, God? I mean, like, we know it's like a given, right? So I don't kind of blame David at this point because I know he's doing, he's doing what's his heart to do. He loves the Lord. He loves the Lord. And God loves him. And so he's, a, he's exciting the people. They're all going to come together. You're going to gather all the people from all, all of our family that's scattered everywhere. We're going to get them all in here, and we're going to bring the ark back home. And we're all going to do it as a family. We're all going to participate. We're all going to have the, you know, the fun together and the rejoicing together and the praise together. It's going to be an awesome party. We all got to be there. Nothing's wrong with that. Okay? So they all agreed. Boop, boop. Okay, so David gathered all of Israel together from Sihor, the brook of Egypt, the interest of Hemoth to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. And David and all of Israel went, out, went up to Bala, that is to Kiriath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord, which is called by the name of him who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah in Ohio. His brother drove the cart. And David and all of Israel merrily celebrated before God with all of their might, with songs and with lyres and with hearts and trampolines, oh, trampolines and tambourines. There we, that would be a sight, wouldn't it? Uh, tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. So I want you to get the, you have to get this picture in your mind. you got to use your imagination, okay? There are all these people who came from all over the place, okay? And they have gone to Judah, and here is the ark of God. I mean, this this is the throne of God on earth. This is, a, this is not just a box. Do you know what I mean? Like, this is, this is everything. And he's on, a, uh, he's on a cart, but 
he, he's been kind of left there, not with any weightiness, because they had gone through so much with Saul. You know what I mean? So there's not, there's not the importance on the ark that there should have been. So they all gather together, and they pick the card up, and they start moving towards. And now David, he's, he's a worshiper, right? So he has everybody worshiping. What you're seeing is like a Mardi Gras party down, you know, Bourbon Street in New Orleans with people going nuts beads, you know what I mean? Like, they're all, what? They're all dancing, the tambourines are going, and the horns are going, they're shouting, they're praising God, and if you look at that, you'd be like, whoa, they're having a party. I like Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, and we want to join in with them, because it looks like they're having the best time ever. I would probably think they probably had some wine, too, so they probably were a little tipsy also, you know what I mean? I, they did not drink fermented wine in that, that would be straight juice. No, that'd be a lie, it was wine. Um, but... So there's this huge, I mean, it's like you walking into a church and you seeing the church full of people and everybody, the tension's this way and we're all praising God, we're sweating, we're jumping. Everyone's like, wow, this place is so cool. There's so much energy. And the people who are doing it are doing it for the Lord. Verse 9, when they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put out his hand to study the ark, for the oxen that were drawn in the cart stumbled <laughs> and were rested. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he touched the ark, and there he died. Like, I've read this 10,000 times, but I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, I always think about what it would be like if I was, like, be Peter and see Ananias and Sapphira come up to me and lie to me and then be like, poof, poof, just drop dead in front of me. Dude. Part of me would be like, that's so cool. <laughs> just being honest, that's the part that needs prayer. The other part of me would be like, my butt would pucker. You know what I mean? I'd be like, whoa, I fear God. You know what I mean? When someone, dro- when someone drops dead, that's what happened to me when I, when I was in the world before I got saved. When I walked into that club and that man had a heart attack and died right there at the threshing floor where I was, the threshold where I was walking by, I said, I got to go home. I cannot be here. God's been messing with me all night. He's dead. I got to go. It freaked me out. I just, all you need to know is I was up, I was drinking, having a good time. Guy dropped down, dropped him dead right in front of me. I was like, whoa, I'm going this way. <laughs> going back home. Him and some other people were praying that God would get me. Apparently, he got the guy in front of me, so maybe his aim is off, or I'm like, <laughs> just kidding. Like, the guy didn't die for me. <laughs> it's a bad joke, but it was a funny joke. <laughs> See, that's the part of me that needs prayer. Y'all need to pray for me because I have these thoughts all the time. Okay. <laughs> so that means you've got me reserved. Hmm. See? You, you don't know what you're missing. Okay. Um, anyway, so he drops down dead. Like, okay, so you talk about a buzz kill. I mean, <laughs> I, can you imagine everybody's like, woohoo, Jesus, Yahweh. <laughs> Boom. Everybody stopped. Like that one tambourine. Like, <laughs> slowly getting quieter. You know what I mean? Like it had to trickle down a little bit before everybody realized he did. Because, <laughs> you know, they probably thought at first, oh, he tripped. You know what I mean? And they're like, no, he uh, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't know what to do. I mean, seriously, if Ananias and Fire were in church, we were all in here today. We were all praising God. And one of us dropped dead. I, I think it would interrupt the meeting. You know what I mean? Like, we, we wouldn't be praising God all around them. <laughs> around here, hopefully, some people would get over him and, you know, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Okay. Uh, but it, he wasn't. Not, let me just say this. Uzzah and Ananias and Sapphira, they did not die because they were praising Jesus. They were, <laughs> they were coming against the anointing. And that's, you want to raise those people back up from the grave. I'm just saying, let them die. <laughs> if God said you're done, they're done, go on, they're dead. Uh, I know it's harsh, but you look, we all, we all have an appointed time that we are to die. Amen? And if you're in sin and you die, there's nothing I can do for you. Like him. Um, we're in God. It's his breath, not mine. Anyway, so. Uh, Party's over. King David, 
His name means what? Boiling over hot, fervent love. Love was loving the people, and he was loving his God. And he was loving his presence. And he loved his presence so much, he wanted that presence with him where he was. And now we have a rut row because we have a man down. And nobody, nobody in the general vicinity wants to take care of the ark. <laughs> I would think, you know, you have that one relative that they visit, you know what I mean? They're like, they're going to stay at your house, right? <laughs> they're not staying at my house, are they? <laughs> I don't know, y'all would do that, but I have had this conversation. So, you know, like, when you have that guy, like, I don't want him to stay at my house, stay at your house. Like, no, I don't want him at my house. Let him go to their house. And everybody's had this conversation. Well, we don't want the ark there. Because they all know we're going to die. He come into our house, we're all dead. Dead, dead, dead. There's no way we're all going to live. We don't want that ark. Get that presence away from us. <laughs> when I first got saved, they were, you know, like I said, we were in one of those little churches that crazy old people holler and run and whee! and all that stuff. <laughs> Praying on people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I tell you what, though, I was like, my eyeballs were bugging out of my head. I was like, what is this? I mean, I had never experienced anything like that before. <laughs> it was kind of terrifying. So I kind of know the way they feel probably. Okay, so. Uzzah, smote, smitten, smoted. Verse 11, and David was offended. <laughs> Perfect David. We love David. He's the king. Woohoo! Jesus come out of his line. David was offended. David was offended because the Lord broke out upon Uzzah. Hmm. And David was afraid of God that day. <laughs> that is like the appropriate response. I'm just saying. When he dies, we should all have a little bit of fear. David was afraid of God that day, and he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? Because I have a feeling David was thinking, my household might die too, because I obviously we can't bring him with us because there's a terror on us right here. David did not want to bring it home to his own household, and he was the king. He was offended and afraid. Can you be honest with yourselves and say, I have really found myself often offended and yet still afraid of this God I serve. So David did not bring the ark home to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house for three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. So there's these wonderful intentions. David wants the spirit of God, the, the, the throne of God to come and be in the, in the center of where Israel's heart is. And things did not go. He had wonderful intentions, but he had a horrible process, and then a horrible outcome. And I believe when you look at David's life and you see how Saul came against him and all the stuff that he had to go through, how he was rejected by his brothers and his father and all of this horrible stuff that he went through, we, we all can acknowledge David's humility and just how, how worshipful and, how, you know, he was just so good to God and, and God loved him. But now we're seeing this man who had this intimacy with God is now offended and afraid. And I truly believe it's because when David came into that kingship over all of the people, there was this moment, like, this is it. It's my purpose. I love God. I want to bring him with me. But he didn't take the time because he just assumed. He didn't take the time to ask the Lord, how do we do this? He had not been around anybody who knew what to do. Because when Saul had it, things weren't all appropriate. And so this moment in David's life, as harsh as it seems to us, is 
pivotal for him because now he's being challenged in the area of worship. Hello, he had a whole celebration come. He's being challenged by the people that he governs over. Hello, they were following the orders of their king. Maybe he screwed up. Everything begins to be questioned in his heart. And now he knows, okay, I'm afraid of God, and I'm also offended at him. And this is a pivotal moment for him. Because if he's going to rule Israel the way he was anointed to rule Israel, he had to go through this first. And that's why him doing this is why he was able, when the next one, when the Philistines came up, do I go? Yeah, why? Because I learned a lesson because God did not approve my plan last time. I had a wonderful idea, but he didn't say yes to it. And I didn't wait long enough to hear what his reply was. And we do things spiritually because we just think God's approving of it because of the Spirit. And, beloved, it's not of the Spirit. Or maybe it is, but it's the wrong time. There is nothing more important as time. Your timing is... You, you listening to God and being so intent to hear what he has to say, and in that moment of perfect alignment between heaven and earth, you become the fullness of God and say something or do something. That alignment is it's so powerful. No enemy can overtake it. It's literally that heaven fills you up and you say or do whatever it is God says to you to say and do. And you make heaven reach earth, which is exactly what Jesus wants us to do, right? Now, we think heaven coming to earth as a praise song. Heaven coming to earth is you so fully attentive to what he is saying to you and so fully obedient to what he said that then heaven can come through a vessel on earth. Because Jesus was the template. I don't say anything I haven't heard my father say, and I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. You mean I got to live my life asking Jesus? Yes, you do. I always say this. Look, you don't have to ask Jesus. Don't go into your closet and be the whole, oh, Lord, what do I wear today? What would you have me wear today? He doesn't need you to do that. Come on, you are an adult. You have a brain. Put on some freaking clothes, okay? Wear them modestly. All right, okay. However, here's the thing. If you go into your closet, you're like, oh, I'm going to look at this. And then he says, hey, can you wear a red blouse today? You're like, why does he care about what? Just, get, just, just because you're going to be in the waiting room and somebody walks in and they know they're looking for somebody with a red shirt. Because Jesus went by that pool. Because he said that day, go by that pool. He didn't have to walk the way he walked. He took even the, the route that he took sometimes was because that's exactly what the father wanted. He showed up at the woman at the well because that wasn't on the way. It's where he was supposed to go. Okay, so let's go over here and I'll be done. Ba, ba, ba. Okay, verse 15. Oh, chapter 15, sorry, not verse 15. <laughs> and I'm done. Says David made for himself houses in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Listen, if you hear nothing that I say tonight but this, you need to make the next however many days you have on this earth daily preparing a place for the ark of his presence. And then you carry the place with you, guys. You're carrying it with you. <laughs> it's in your heart. You don't leave it at home and then go to work and be all, <laughs> we don't compartmentalize our lives. The presence comes with us. But we have to be people who are forever preparing a place. He may say, get that carpet out, put a new one in now. You're like, okay, Lord, you said so. So then David said, none shall carry, none should carry the ark of God but the Levites. For the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister to him forever. I just want to tell you, somewhere in all that stuff we didn't read tonight, David got a clue. David's like, wait a second, in the presence of God, no, it's not supposed to be on a cart. And there are very some, some specific people who are called to carry the ark, and the way they're supposed to carry the ark, see, he was offended and afraid, but he listened. 
He did it wrong before, but the way he did it wrong did not disqualify him for doing what he, his heart wanted to do. See, his motive was pure. It was his action that went against the word of God. And we cannot just have wonderful good hearts and good intentions. It has to line up with the command. There's a certain order and prescription that God has given to us for every situation we face. And you have to do it according to his will. So that's why David was like, oh, they came up to me in that valley here again. Do I go again, God? He got a clue. Sometimes people dying around us, for lack of a better term, is a very good eye-opener for us to realize that what God has said, he says, and he means it. So David assembled all of Israel at Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to his place, which he had prepared for, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to read all that stuff. Okay, verse uh, 13. Oh, it's 12. And said to them, you are the heads of the father's house of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I prepared for it. For because you bore it not as God directed at the first, the Lord our God broke forth upon us. Come on. David was in control of what the way they were doing it before. And now he's telling the Levites, look, you have to, first of all, sanctify yourself, and this is the way we had to do it. We didn't do it because we... Not you Levites who are supposed to know. We didn't do it the way God said to do it. He broke forth on us. You're like, why have I had to deal with some of the pain, some of the crap that, you know, just because these two go through? Because it's us. Because we're a body. It didn't affect you if you just come to church. If you came to church, you ain't got a clue what we've been going through. But if you've had some pain and you've had some sorrow and some intercession, why? Because you're family. Because when I stub my finger, my whole body knows it. So if you've been like, I'm clueless, there's your answer right there. Get in the body. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Look what he says. It broke forth upon us because we did not seek him in the way he ordained. Man. That's so powerful. And this is how he could be respected as a leader because he owned up to it. He didn't lay the blame on them because a leader who sits back and like, oh, y'all do it. I'm perfect over here. No. David was at war with them. He was at worship with them. He was seeking God's face with them. And he's like, look, it's not that I'm perfect and you aren't. We screwed this up, guys. As a family, we got to get it back to the way it was. God wants all of us to bring the healing. Because David could not bring the ark in without the priests. Come on, guys. This is why we value relationships so much. Because we can't have the presence here. Him and I can get together and I can sing, we can dance, we can praise, we can pray in the spirit. But it's not going to be the same. And we can't do it by ourselves. We have to have everybody who said, I'm a part of this body to help carry the weight of his presence so that we all can enjoy it. And that is why, yes, do we get upset when you don't show up? Sometimes, I know it's a good reason, and sometimes you're just being a baby, and you're whining about something. And let's just be honest about it and tell somebody, I don't feel like coming because I'm freaking mad. I'm offended at God right now. That's why when you just say, oh, I'm not up and doing that part of the ministry anymore, it takes us off because what? You just laid the burden on everybody else because you don't want to do what you, God told you to do. Look, I love you, but that's the truth. The reason why we all get, you know, all, all, because we're all carrying it together. When you come off your spot on the wall, there's a gaping hole, and the enemy can come in, and you are supposed to be on top. And then you get one. why is the church going through all this crap? Because you got off the wall. Which means I got off the wall. Oh, Jesus, I feel the spirit of God. We got to quit laying blame. And realize we have all done it. We're all doing it. We're all responsible for what happened, what hurt. But guess what? We're all responsible for bringing the presence of God back into this place in such a way that nobody will be able to counter and pull down what God is doing. I tell you what, 
when we go on vacation, we hadn't gone in a while, but look, there, my, my, my children, they have lots of children now. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm so blessed. I said my odds of coming to the daycare and not being seen are diminishing over because I, now it's three to one. Before it was only one to one, then it was two to one, and now it's three to one. So it doesn't matter what room I go into, one of them sees me. And I can't leave without them when they see me. I can't. It's a horrible thing. <laughs> they exhaust me, but God, I love them. <laughs> oh. So it was, we would go on vacation, and y'all can understand, all of us fitting into the car, and my husband, I love my husband, he's such a planner and a, a list guy, and we had to bring the trailers, because we're caught, we're, he wants to buy all the food here, and then we'll take it, and then all of the, you know, beach stuff that we've ever bought, every time we've ever gone, has to go, and I'm like, I, it's phenomenal what he does, because I don't have to worry about anything, he's doing it. You know, I, my, my bag is packed. I'm done. Tell me what I got to cook when I'm there. I'm there. I'll do it. You know what I mean? But he's a planner. He puts everything in it. And that can be stressful sometimes. Just a little bit. He's so soft-spoken and never hurried and, you know, so. <laughs> and then we get there, like, you know, and look. You know, when they're babies, and even though we have a nice condo on the beach, it's a long way down. We gotta, you, know, you get all the way down there, and then, you know, oh, no, the, the diaper, we forgot this. Oh, God, you know what I mean? you got to walk back up the stairs, and you can't walk when you get home because you have, you have like, you have walked up, like, the Empire State Building stairs up and down, up and down, up and down. You know what I mean? And then I'm like, why did I come all the way to Florida just to cook? I can do this at home. You know, all those kind of things that go through my mind that I never say to them because I love them so much. I just put special seasoning on their food. And then, and we can have contention because we're all in the same house together. All of us are all, and it's not a big house, it's a small house. So we're all together all the time. And there could be, by the end of the trip, a little, get away from me. I love you. I love your children. Get them away. Right? Amen. So he has to go on vacation with his in-laws. Poor baby. If you didn't have the best in-laws in the whole wide world, you'd really be screwed. But you're not. So, okay, so. <laughs> but, you know, it's when it's in all that stuff. Like, we, they, one time we took everybody and his dad and his mom. It was, ter- it was a long trip. It was a very long trip. And the whole time you're on vacation, you think to yourself, I am never doing this again. I'm never bringing all of you with me ever again. At this point, I'm going by myself. He's not even going. I'm like, I'm done with all of you. And then... A couple months pass. And then we're like, when are we going to the beach together? Because all of a sudden, all the stuff that was irritating, we don't care about anymore. We remember we were a family, and we had fun together. You know, we did do stuff we don't normally do together, you know? And all of a sudden, and then I can't wait to go again. And that's how family is. And we've gone through lots of different things over the last two years that have been challenging for us, and we can all be like, rah, rah, rah. But guess what? We're already thinking in the he- ahead, like, okay, those hard times, they bound us together. They made us love each other more. Seriously, I have more affection and love for you guys. I'm, I'm being honest. Please don't take me the wrong way. But look, loving people in general is not a really easy thing for me. It's a, it's a serious thing that God does in my heart because I don't have a mercy gift at all. I mean, I zero mercy gift. And with my own problems, with rejection, all those things, I don't willingly put myself out there. You may see me out going here, but it's not how I am. I leave, no, I'm like, y'all leave me alone. Stop talking to me. Leave me alone. But through all of this, my affection for you guys, look, if anyone said anything about you or came against you, I was fighting for you. I was going to be in your face. I was going to be in their face. I was going to protect you. But something in my heart has changed, and I have such a deep affection for you guys. And I'm sorry that I didn't portray that before, because I was. I know I'm a hard butt. I get that. I'm a black and white person. It's hard to get into into me. But the love I have for y'all, it's more than I've ever had. I pray for you guys now in a way I've never prayed before. I look forward to coming to church to spend time with you more than I ever have. I'm going to use Kathy as an example. She can get mad at me. But I, Kathy, she, we, I've known her and Liz forever, seems like. 
we both had to deal with Liz and her problem stuff. Teenager. Brr. But do you know that something has so significantly happened in my heart when it comes to Kathy? I mean, I, and I tell her now all the time, I, I love her. Like, she's probably like, why is she telling me she loves me all the time? I don't know. What do I do to do? You know why? Because when I was in the hospital, you fed me and you loved me. When I was at my ugliest, you still believed in me. And I'm sorry it took me so long to get it. You can keep reading through this, but you'll see that the same exuberant praise that they have when they're bringing the ark the wrong way, they have again bringing it God's way. My point to that is this. Just like the valley was the same and the enemy was the same, there was a different course of action. The praise was the same when they had the right intention and the wrong command. It was exactly the same as when they had the right intention and the right command. So we're not looking for desert beach oasis. It's desert to desert. And the only thing different about how we act, what we say, and what our heart desires is that we do it according to the word. Tina. Amen. So my heart in prayer, I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to declare over you. If you want it, you say amen to me, Lord. Yes. So I'm just going to declare that in this house there is an increase of a keen ear. Father, I just pray over every heart that they will be like a, an antenna right now coming through their heart. They'll be able to tune in so accurately to your word, to your heart, to your, to your voice, Lord, that we would be people who would strive to continue to prepare a place for you inside of us so that your presence can come and, and dwell with us. Open our ears, Lord. Let our eyes see. And Father, I ask just for my own, just, just because I want to, I ask that you would pour a blessing upon this body of believers, that this family, this tribe that we are here, that you would pour a blessing, a favor, and goodness upon every household, that there would just be an, a, just a, an exuberant amount of goodness coming out of every heart and every home that's represented here tonight. Father, you are the glory and the lifter of our heads. Father, lift us up. Unite us in greater purpose and in greater love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you all. See you later. Forget the youth Christmas, the kids point Christmas party is this Saturday. If you haven't registered, there's a link on the Facebook page, and if you go onto your calendar on your app, the registration's there too. <laughs>